I'm going to be um, talking about this idea of transdar, um, which is both a um, a way of just looking back at archives, so working with the archives and saying, oh, that that sparked something in me, that story of um, of somebody somebody trying on a, you know a, a dress or somebody um, uh, you know wanting to wear their hair long or whatever it is that I feel like that resonates with me whether it's whether we can confirm is this person is trans or not and and then also this idea of imagining um, so we we can look back at history and all those possibilities uh, possibilities of transness and um, and 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 elaborate that into new creative possibilities that we can make up ourselves um, and so this relates very much to my uh, research recently uh, my dissertation research uh, at the uh, Royal College of Art and the Victoria and Albert Museum where I've been looking at theatrical uh, performances that engage with this notion of trans dar particularly um, I've really enjoyed this this production, which I have an image of here, which is uh, of a yeah, performance called Moll and the Future Kings that was produced in 2019 at the Shakespeare's Globe um, by a wonderful gaggle of uh, trans performers convened by um, S. Grange, who you can see here in the, in the uh, hat with the red feather on the left. Um, who sort of devised this this performance, um, but also several others in this um, uh, in this shot, such as Mal Parry, who did a lot of the costuming for the show, uh, who you see in the wonderful sort of ghoulish makeup and this great um, uh, almost sheer ruff, and um, they'd worked together to produce this semi-improvised um, performance that was inspired by this historical figure called Mole Cutpurse. Um, and what they did is that they had these, these workshops to talking about Mole, who they are, looking at the archives, and then using their archive as a sort of prompt or an invitation to then embody this character, whoever they feel this character might be like in 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 um in terms of their life beyond what's in the archives because a great issue in what we have with our archival record is that they're so um they're so much about medical history or um uh legal history especially when you get prior to the 1900s and there's very little about um you know what they would like to wear going to a party or what they what they might what make them feel at home or um what gifts they got and so all of these kinds of things um we try to these performers were trying to imagine here um and i got really excited by this and um yes i've been trying to uh, keep an eye out and started noticing all these other ways in which trans performers have been um, have been have been uh, imagining and you know drawing creating art describing um, of different trans resonant historical figures um, and so and um, and yeah basically this is just an ode to the importance of historical fiction in um queer communities uh in 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 looking back to the past seeing the partialness of the archival record and trying we're fighting what feels like the same fight in a way um or playing what feels like the same games or um loving that what feels like the same kind of love um yeah these connections we feel is really important and beautiful um so i will talk more about more cut purse in a minute um but for now i just want to focus on the theory that um that 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 kind of embeds this this practice so the i mentioned possibility quite a bit earlier and this derives from the notion of trans possibility that was put forward by this brilliant uh, trans historian that's on the left called Kit Hyam and um, they wrote in their wonderful book which I really recommend before we were trans um, they wrote quote 
They are histories of gender not being binary. These people might not have been like me. I might not be able to speak of them, even equivocally, as trans people, but they are people I can relate to nonetheless. And that idea of relating to someone and feeling like there's, um, and, and, and that I think the key word here is might, you know, they might not be, but they might also be uh, trans. And I think that's really exciting. Um, but also, you know, I think has an important, um, an important sort of idea of communal sharing of a historical figure in it. We're not claiming these people as one identity or another. And so, I mean, a big thing that Kit responds to is, um, is trans exclusionary radical feminists within history um, in the study of history um, that have been trying to claim figures as, no, these are women, these are not trans, part of, we're trying to take this away from women's history, such as icons like Anne Lister. Um, and what, what Kit responds to this is by saying, yes, there is a cis possibility, but there's trans possibilities too. And it's important to acknowledge both of these things. Um, uh, and I think that really opens up um, or, or, or rather helps avoid the unnecessary um, debate between historians of marginalised identities, trying to say this person is part of women's history, radical women's history, not part of trans history, etc. Um, another thing that, right, another theory that would really interest me is that of Sadia Hartman, who is um, on the right, and um, uh, she puts forward this very academic notion of critical fabulation, it's called, um, which took me a long time to get my head around, to be honest with you, and it wasn't until um, I, I saw people, artists really talk about it, um, that I, I started to understand it's, um, it's, it's how inspiring it can be for everyone who is creative and thinking about the past, especially marginalised histories. So um, she talks about, quote, imagine what cannot be verified. It is a history of an unrecoverable past. It is a narrative of what might have been or could have been. It is a history written with and against the archive. And that idea of being with and against the archive is in is is kind of the what the how you distill the term critical fabulation because the the critical is about writing with the archive, looking at it and interrogating it for what's missing. Um, but what is what little kernels of um, marginalised. Um, stories there are and then writing against the archive going beyond those little kernels being inspired by them yes but also uh, being um, uh, being creative being fabulous and that's what the notion of fabulation comes from it's take is taking a critical stance on these um, these 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 fragmentary archival records and then creating to elaborate from them to create more more, 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 more detailed, more rich, more real, more human stories of the past um, that go beyond legal records or medical records. Um, and I think what's what's really important about this as well, and it's not in this quote, but is something that I've been thinking about a lot that Hartman says, is that is is that it's really important to balance creativity with a respect for the unknown. And I think that also ties in with what I am saying, is that we it's important to be creative and elaborate beyond the archival record. But it's also important to acknowledge whilst doing that, that we're not claiming these things as facts and that we, we leave the possibility for those things never to have happened or for those people we might think of being trans to might not be trans. Um, and so that kind of what, what they term it is a quote, refusal to provide closure. Um, and I think that is both. Um, it's both it stops. It's not quite satisfying. Yes. So it can be frustrating to not be able to claim these people, but it's also respectful, I think, of these past figures. And it's 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 true. It feels real. Um, and so I appreciate that duality here of 
exciting possibilities, but also acknowledging that we don't know. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's the theory. And that leads me on nicely to some examples of how people have created um, created art responding to historical figures and yet not claiming their creations as fact. So um, here we have, I'm going to take a sip of water and give you a chance to take a little look at some of these um, really exciting uh, products, artworks. So I understand these as all sort of like imagination exercises um, in what these trans historical figures might be. Um, so we have um, uh, two people, actually three people dressing up as a trans historical figure, uh, including myself on the bottom left. Uh, we have uh, a painting of, inspired by another painting of a historical trans figure and a sort of digital drawing that's um that's really quite fun that takes a painting of a potentially trans historical figure and reimagines it as um as 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 a painting of a uh of a drag queen but with sort of a lot of contemporary references like these wonderful polka dots that you wouldn't have in chevalier Dion's time um but what I'm going to do now is, um, as I go through these and talk a bit about the artist's interpretation, I'm going to give you a few fun facts about these historical figures. Because in a little bit, once we get through all of these, and I have another slide too, I'm going to invite everyone to take 10 minutes to pick one of these figures, or perhaps a trans historical figure you already know, come, or come across, and to, based on my fun facts, or perhaps some other, if you want to do a little quick Google search um, about them, I invite you to uh, imagine some more things about them and to write some of these things down. You can use the jam board, it's available, you can draw, you can take a screenshot and add some digital drawing to, to the images like we have in the bottom right interpretation. Um, and then if you would like to, you have the option to share that with the group at the end as our own little collection of trans historical fictions. So, uh, top left, we have, uh, you might recognise from the first slide, there's this wonderful uh, red feathered hat, which is worn by, again, S. Grange, who is the creator or the um, organiser of um, that that semi-improvised performance inspired by Mole Cut Purse at Shakespeare's Globe that I showed to you on the first slide. Uh, now, Mole, you, they are dressed up here as Mole Cut Purse, inspired very heavily um, by uh, this print on the left, which is from Mole Cut Purse's life, who uh, they were a, a Jacobeans, this is early 17th century time of Shakespeare, living in London, performer and convict who was dubbed governess of the London's underworld. Mole was a common name for a disreputable uh, young woman and cut purse referred to a thief who cut purses to steal their contents. Mole wore a, a men's doublet, a man's doublet and breeches, frequented taverns and smoked a pipe. As you can see here, them smoking a pipe, which was not customary for women to do at the time. Mull regularly uh, performed at the Fortune Playhouse, which was in the Red Light District. In one account, Mull is said to have got on stage, engaged in improvised banter with the audience, played the lute and sang obscene songs. Um, and one of the very fun parts of the performance, just to give you a little snippet, a very much a, the one that, um, that, that S. Grange did in the Globe recently, inspired by this historical figure. One of aspects of that improvised performance, very much uh, centered improvised banter with the audience, the lute playing and the singing of obscene songs. And that was directly inspired by Mole. But of course, the court record in which they say that they, um, it, that they joked with the audience, played the lute and sang obscene songs, leaves it there. What, what, what obscene songs were they singing? What were they playing on the lute? What kind of jokes do they tell with the audience? This is the kind of thing that S and their 
gaggle of wonderful trans performers, drag kings, got up on stage at the Globe recently to imagine her audiences. Um, now, on the top right, we have um, two oil paintings um, or snippets of them. Uh, and they represent an unnamed, well, on the left, we have a representation by an artist, a colonial um, anthropologist called George Catlin of an unnamed 19th century two-spirit person. Um, and uh, so this is like an anthropological document. Um, and then on the right, we have an artist's interpretation by Kent Monkman, who is a contemporary two-spirit person um, who likes to create work that uh, quotes from or, you know, takes here's we have here literally like visually quoting from uh the western art history and then reimagining it in ways that um uh that uh that critically respond to what was left out in those histories um and the misrepresentation of them of two-spirit people um by in western art history and so um uh what we have here on the right, oh, I should mention that two spirit, by the way, is an umbrella term invented in 1990. Um, if anyone doesn't know, that loosely encapsulates um, various non binary identities constructed by a wide variety of First Nations and Native American indigenous groups who have lived in lands now occupied by uh, Canada and the US. Um, and so, yeah, during uh, 19th century, um, this, this artist called George Catlin went to, uh, so on the left, the artist George Catlin went to um, the US and painted this uh, uh, one two-spirit person and said, quote, it is one of the most disgusting things I've ever seen. I should wish it might be extinguished before it be more fully recorded. They also um, George Catlin also made a deliberate attempt to remove any um, Western clothing that was worn by contemporary by um, two spirit people at the time that had been imported during the 19th century, because um, George Catlin, as a colonial anthropologist, um, claimed that that would be uh, that, that would that would be impure an impure representation of Native American people. They wanted to, he wanted to reduce them to this type, this singular type, um, rather than see and as a sort of monolith of the past, rather than see them as interacting um, uh, and having agency within um, international trade. And so Kent Monkman, the contemporary artist now, two-spirit person, responds on the right by um, putting this two-spirit figure in Louboutin shoes um, as a sort of um, riposte to a, a challenge to this idea that um, that um, that there was no Western attributes um, worn by these figures. Um, and um, as a sort of nod to this challenging um, nature of their work, Monkman describes this this figure, who's their like their two spirit um, uh, representation of themselves in their art, as they call them mischief, um, and um, and they have Catelyn, the colonial painter, as their nemesis, um, in which they create this backstory where mischief, this two spirit person. Um, uh, was lulled by false promises of Catelyn to leave the nation and tour with Europe uh, with Catelyn as one of his touring exhibits, which actually did happen. Uh, so this is a relation to the archive, but it wasn't with Miss Chief or necessarily this particular two-spirit person represented here, um, but with other indigenous North Americans. Um, and then uh, Miss Chief is said to have escaped from him, uh, interacting subversively with Europeans and then heading back to their nation with revolutionary intentions. Um, I will. Um, oh, I didn't mention about my talk much about my little version of mole cut purse. Uh, so I'll just touch briefly on that. I'm there wearing moles. Well, my version of Moll's hat with a little floral moment. Um, I've got, I know that they kept a parrot. Um, and so I, I found a little shirt that had birds on it. Um, and if you can see, if I, can I zoom in? Yes, I can zoom in, this will help. Um, so I, I did a little sort of meditating exercise thinking about, and you guys can do this later if you want to do the written option rather than drawing or dressing up as, um, but just trying to imagine what would Moll, what would make Moll feel at home? 
what would they like as a gift? And so I thought of seeds for them for their pistachios, and I uh, seeds for them for their parrot. And then I thought of pistachios. I had pistachios, and I got some out to give to them. And I felt this churning in my belly. And I was like, oh, maybe maybe they don't like pistachios. And so I got this bird feed ball that I'd had hanging outside, and I sat it down. Um, and I thought that they might like a bear because I know they used to go to bear painting and they used to frequent taverns. So I thought I'd give them alcohol and some tobacco and some money. Um, so, yeah, that was just my little meditative interpretive exercise and um, thinking about what mole might have been like or what I might like to give mole. Um, uh, so, yes, then here we have um, uh, uh, Nzinga, the ruler of, ruler of Ndongo and Matambe, um, who was a 17th century ruler um, who uh, uh, who um, uh, was the king of Ndongo or king queen um, of and ruler of Ndongo um, uh, and then conquered Matamba allied with the Dutch West India Company um, to fight the Portuguese who had declared war on Ndongo. And then cleverly um, to weaken the Portuguese colonial administration, um, they dispatched messengers to the Portuguese um, colonies to encourage slaves to flee Portuguese plantations and join um, Nzinga's kingdom. Um, and then when the Portuguese um, fought back um, and then they um a treaty was signed that Nzinga would um would return slaves um but then Nzinga after signing the treaty um said there are no slaves in my kingdom and they they were all been emancipated and so there was going to be no returning of slaves um and I have on the on next to this image on the left of of Nzinga there is a there is a drag impersonation interpretation by an amazing drag king called Syro, who I um, have had the pleasure to have worked with a few times, amazing person, and also performed in um, the Model and the Future Kings um, performance at the Globe. And uh, they did this performance here where they commissioned a costume to be produced that was inspired by um, uh, the uh, um, Nzinga and uh, yeah, did this spoken word performance that includes the phrase, there are no slaves in my kingdom. Um, then we have, moving swiftly on, because I'm realizing time, um, we have uh, um, the Chevalier Deon, um, and a version of them by an amazing uh, drag performer called Harry Bartlett, um, who has kind of specialized in taking historical sort of oil paintings, historical figures, and turning them into drag queens. Um, so uh, Chevalier Dion was a very popular figure and images of them were collected by queer people in their time, such as Horace Walpole, who was the founder of the queer neo-Gothic style. Um, and uh, when Chevalier um, Dion left France for England, um, they were, they, um, identified as a man, they were a spy um, for the French king um, and a military captain. Um, and they lived a lot of the time in England before returning to France, um, then as a as a as a celebrity, um, but also identifying as a woman now at this time. And I think they have a really interesting story of gender fluidity that I very much relate to um, as, a, as somebody who identifies as gender fluid. Um, and yeah, when France joined the American War of Independence, um, they all petitioned the government to allow them to um, uh, take on their male captain's attire again and fight in the war. Um, but the government pressured them to enter, enter a um, convent um, and then um, subsequently arrested them um, when they refused um, and um, released the Chevalier Deon on a promise that they would stop asking to be um, to be able to fight in the army as a man again. Um, and later after that, they, they returned to England and were um, documented in this brilliant um, uh, is to have uh, in front of the Prince of Wales fought uh, engaged in a sword fight with a famous musician while dressed in women's clothing to the dismay of um, the, the male musician who was fighting them. Um, so yeah, there's a few tidbits into those trans historical figures and I'm going to speed through um, a few other um, 
historical figures to give you some more options for your creative activity. Um, and so James Gray, we have in the top left, who was an 18th century trans masculine soldier who joined the army at the age 25 and had a falling out with a sergeant in their regiment who accused um, Gray of neglecting their duties um, by refusing to um, facilitate um, sex between the sergeant and a local woman. And so for, for, for this, um, uh, this, this, this supposed um, uh, crime or misdemeanor, um, Gray was sentenced to 600 lashes and received 500 while tied to a castle gate in Carlisle. Several plays have been made about their life. Um, so they form a great example for this kind of historical fiction about trans figures of the past. Now, I'm going to talk about two different groups of people now because um, uh, I wanted to kind of give some mixture and I think this is important and interesting of some figures who we know the names of, but also some figures who remain unnamed in the archival record and are known by groups of people, whether it's um, uh, these galley here of ancient Rome and then they're going to talk about the Asinus of ancient Mesopotamia. So the galley were um, uh, eunuch priests um, of the goddess Cybel in ancient Greece and Rome and literature of the time presents them as wearing bright clothes, heavy jewellery, makeup and sporting bleached and crimped hair. Um, I can certainly align that with how I used to dress when I was about 16. Um, it was, that was a time. Um, and they, um, this practice is thought to have derived from Mesopotamia, which is interesting um, because the Asinus come up next are also um, uh, eunuch priests of a different deity, um, of so a deity within the Mesopotamian pantheon of deities. Um, that they have a kind of similar story to the galley. So it's thought that perhaps the galley may descend from or derive from the Asinus, who knows? Um, so as well as being mythical figures, um, these Asinus, they were um they were in in the story of this um incredible deity Inanna, um, who's who who's basically saved by Asinus, their dev devotees, descending into um, hell, into the netherworld to um, save the deity, save the goddess um, from death. And um, in return, um, all of their, quote, maleness, Inanna turned female, end quote. And that's from the Babylonian poem, The Epic of Era. So as well as being these mythological figures, they were also real devotees of this deity as in um people like priests um in real life in the temples and um the combination of masculine and feminine attributes was central um so the, for example uh, as well as um these these um priests themselves in their everyday dress combining attributes uh, there would be a festival once a year for um this 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 deity in which um the there's a there's a contemporary text from ancient mesopotamia that says quote the women adorn their right sides with men's clothing the men adorn their left side with women's clothing um so that's that interesting and i think a really you know potentially inspirational um uh historical context in that these figures encouraged everyone else in the in in the area who who were shared in this religion to join in with this cross dressing. Um, so then we have on the right, uh, top right, Wewa, who is a member of the Zuni people um, from the land now currently occupied by the U.S. state of New Mexico. Um, they were multimedia artists, but their work generally focused on mediums that were commonly practiced by two spirit Zuni people, so beadwork, weaving, and pottery. This photograph was taken by a photographer from the Smithsonian Museum, so an American, um, uh, you know, a Western photographer. And um, interestingly, rather than we were, you know, reaching out to the Smithsonian, the Smithsonian, it was an American anthropologist who brought we were to Washington in order to, for them to showcase them to arts institutions. And this photograph is an exemplar of that because whilst it's taken in, I believe it might even be Central Park or some, some park to make it look like this could have been done in Wewa's homeland. It was actually taken, um, yeah, in the city, in an American city. 
Um, so it's this kind of, um, they have an interesting story of, um, of being, I suppose, taken as a cultural product um, and in a way quite like um, what we saw in the last slide with that two-spirit figure who had been, who had had their um, uh, potential um, Western sort of fashion attributes removed from them to maintain the central idea of purity. Um, we were here, despite being taken to an American city, had been, um, is they're trying to represent them as still being in their homeland of this sort of pure state, um, which is um, interesting and problematic um, uh, colonial um, sort of ideology of extraction. Um, so yeah, they lived this this very interesting life, um, but I don't know much about who they were as a person. And that's what I'd love to imagine. Um, so I might be picking that figure to do some imagining with later, because I'm going to join in with you guys. Um, Yes, so then we have Marlo Moss, who was a painter and sculptor born in um, 1889, whose art influenced Pierre Mondrian. Uh, they dropped out of Slade Art School to move to Cornwall in a place called Le Morne that became known for its queer artists. A neighbour in Le Morne once described Marlo as a dear little soul who used to give all the children of the village a Christmas present. Which is very sweet. Uh, then we have Toyen um, to the right of Marlo. Um, who is a uh, who was a painter, draftsman, and illustrator um, who grew up in a home uh, in Prague, which they left age sixteen to go study um, art, uh, which they got themselves through art school by working at a soap factory. During their twenties, they adopted the name Toyen, which um, which derives from the gender neutral word for citizen, as well as uh, being a play on the Czech words. Um, Toy uh, two year on. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but um, but it means it is he. Um, at the same time, they were part of the uh, Czech avant-garde art union, um, and they travelled to work in Paris, um, uh, and um, then returned to Prague to work with a surrealist group that they co-founded and became increasingly interested in revolutionary politics, socialism. Um, then we have Hatshepsut, who was born around 1508 BCE, uh, known as the King herself. Um, within a period of seven years after assuming the throne, Hatshepsut's statues and reliefs progressed from depictions of a subordinate queen ruling alongside a child king to that of a full-fledged male pharaoh, um, complete with a beard. Uh, and second to last, we have Vesta Tilly, who was one of the best known drag um, kings at their time. Um, they were um, a, in the a late 19th century. Um, they have even been referenced on Drag Race. Um, and um, they were recently shown in a um, uh, in an exhibition that's still on at the moment called Diva um, at the v &A. and I thought it was interesting seeing them presented as a diva. Um, I mean, they also, they didn't just perform as a drag king, they were very famous for their drag king work, but they also performed as various female characters. Um, and there's some wonderful, uh, um, one of the things that really interests me about this time is that you get this all of these wonderfully illustrated music sheets um so this is like yeah so sheet music um with these front covers of prints that have these um the uh, often of of popular songs because of the explosion of um of uh, uh of well, not, I suppose not expert, but there was more people who had pianos in their home. And so people, there was supposed to be more music sheets printed of popular songs from Music Hall. Um, uh, and um, Vesta Tilly is often depicted on those um, in sort of, there's one where they're, uh, they're leading a trip to the countryside and um, they've got a fabulous um, hat on and cane. Um, Yes. Then there's Gladys Bentley, um, who was an American blues musician during the Harlem Renaissance, a lesbian cross-dressing performer um, who headlined clubs with um, drag queen backup dancers as chorus lines. Uh, he would sing raunchy lyrics to popular tunes in a deep growling voice. Um, and then during the 1950s, um, during the during the um, 
hugely homophobic um transphobic uh, mccarthy era uh they started to uh wear dresses and they got married and they claimed to have been cured by taking it is in cured from transness by taking female hormones um i often wonder what was going through their mind what what was their life like during the 20s when they got off stage and how did things change throughout the years to make them to make them feel like they did i'm interested in feeling um and and i want i want to know so much more about all of these figures and so much that we can't know and that takes me back to what we talked about at the beginning of of if this is an unrecoverable past in many ways but we can work with those those bits of facts that we do know to then imagine more so that takes us to our exercise and um, so i've got images and names of all of the figures here for you guys to pick one off and i've got a couple of prompts as well feel free to go off and imagine more in other ways if you would like to um i mean there's one for example that i haven't included here about gift giving and what were they like as a gift that i i i really liked that i did for my mole written exercise so perhaps you want to do that or anything else but here's a couple as examples what would they wear to a party what would they want to yell from a rooftop what would they do for fun what would make them feel at home? 